So um, Dr. Smith was unable to be here. He had a last minute plane cancellation. This is a topic I uh, spoke on in the elective patient at the Clinical Congress in October. Um, so he and I went through these slides today. He was kind enough to um, share them with me. And given the information that's in here, I thought it would be useful to go ahead and share it, um, even though these aren't my slides. Um, neither of us have any disclosures to share. Uh, so liver cirrhosis is the 12th most common cause of death in the United States, and cirrhosis is uh, rising, likely due to increasing rates of viral hepatitis and morbid obesity, and both of those things are contributing to the incidence of umbilical hernias in the cirrhotic patient. But cirrhotics overall, the incidence is around 20 percent, um, cirrhotic patients with significant ascites that increases up to about 40 percent. Uh, this is due to attenuation of the abdominal wall fascia and musculature due to poor nutrition. There's increased pressure from the ascites. Recannulation of the umbilical vein and ultimately what we all fear is the ultimate outcome of necrosis of the overlying skin, causing skin breakdown, ascites leaks, and the potential for bacterial peritonitis. Um, the two hernias that we most commonly see, there's not a lot of literature on ventral hernias and cirrhotics, are the umbilical hernias and the inguinal hernias. These are sort of two different etiologies. Um, umbilical hernias can cause real problems, uh, as previously mentioned. Uh, the in inguinal hernia incidence is not markedly um, increased, and incarceration and strangulation are pretty rare. Um, so non-operative management of cirrhotic patients with umbilical hernia is not without significant risk because these really can present with life-threatening problems. You can also cause incarceration after patients undergo removal of large volumes of ascites. All of the data around emergency repair of umbilical hernias in cirrhotics are based on small series of retrospective data primarily from transplant centers and then from large database analysis with the inability to get granular data on who these patients are. There's always the universal principles, controlling ascites, improving nutrition, and avoiding renal insufficiency as much as possible in a non-elective situation. So the question is, who, how, and when are we repairing these patients? So this table actually shows the uh, three-month mortality rate of patients with cirrhosis by MELS score, irrespective of having an umbilical hernia or any other problems. So you get a feel that, you know, really once you're getting above the MELS score of 20, just the three-month mortality is pretty high for these patients. Um, this retrospective review, again, in a transplant center reviewed 68 patients who underwent an, em an emergency hernia repair. You can see that their median MELD score was 17, mortality 3%, major morbidity 70%, um, and the morbidity was greater than 50% for those patients with a MELD. Um, I think that was supposed to be a MELD greater than 20. Complicated hernia presentation in patients with advanced cirrhosis. So this is, again, a retrospective review of 15 patients who had refractory ascites and associated incarcerated hernia. 12 out of the 15 were emergent operations. And again, you see a pretty significant morbidity and mortality rate here. Looking at, there's two NISQIP database studies. Um, ascites is a variable uh, recorded in the NISQIP database, as well as some of the um, laboratory values that can help you calculate a MELD. So emergency operations are more common in cirrhotic patients. Again, high morbidity and mortality rates. Most of the patients in these series have a MELD of 10 to 19. Um, and uh, risk factors for increased morbidity and mortality are shown there. Management options for ascites include large volume paracentesis, liver transplant, and TIPS. Uh, historical uh, surgical procedures such as parent peritoneal venous shunting and surgical portosystemic shunts, shunts have largely gone out of favor due to their high complication rates. Um, in patients who don't have severe hepatic or renal insufficiency, the TIPS can really be a valuable adjunct to management of these patients. And um, TIPS is superior to large volume paracentesis um, when possible. Um, Dr. Evans may have more insight on this, uh, so this gets a little bit out of my comfort zone. Um, but patients who have cirrhosis and ascites typically present with an anticoagulated picture uh, with elevated PT, uh, PTTs and INRs, but those don't accurately reflect the bleeding risk. Um, the primary issue with these patients is inducing portal hypertension or making it worse if they already have it. 
Um, so the goal here is to not overly try to correct them just based on these uh, coagulation factors. Um, when patients have worsening liver function, they um, can have a rebalanced hemostasis picture, but they just don't have any reserves. So if they get pushed over the edge, um, all of that can go out the window. So the goals for transfusion in these patients are to treat only those patients who develop, develop significant hemostatic bleeding. So if you're uh, seeing them having bleeding that's not surgical, that's the time that you can try to treat them. Uh, prophylactic FFP based on their INR value is not helpful. Um, again, transfusions, if you're giving them a lot of volume, can increase portal and systemic pressures. And really, you shouldn't treat an INR less than 2.5 um, without any evidence of uh, bleeding that's problematic. There's no universally accepted guidelines for platelet transfusion, so recommendations vary between 30 and 50,000 for invasive procedures. And cows don't actually reflect their platelet count because they can be sequestered. And so if you need to give a patient uh, platelets to go to the OR, you can give them a unit and go ahead and take them and not um, look for those counts to respond. Um, finally, one of the really important things I learned about um, this from our liver transplant surgeons um, is that a patent umbilical vein is really a, a special situation. So this is a recannulated umbilical vein that can be really critical um, outflow for patients uh, with severe portal hypertension. And if you ligate this uh, during your surgery, you can um, induce acute liver failure and risk uh, variceal bleeds. So this is an ultrasound uh, and a picture of a patient um, with a recannulated umbilical vein. When you get to the technical aspects of uh, doing a hernia repair on someone that you're forced to take to the operating room, uh, MESH has been shown to have impaired in-growth in the setting of ascites, um, but is associated with uh, minimal wound-related morbidity. Um, in this study, MESH was associated with a higher risk of surgical site infection, but none of the MESH needed to be explant explanted, um, and a significant reduction in recurrence of the hernia. There's not a lot of literature on minimally invasive surgery in these patients, um, which is not surprising. And then finally, when it comes to talking about drains, um, there's a variety of ways that you can do this. So the first study looked at patients who had a peritoneal dialysis catheters placed at the time of the surgery and then went back to the operating room to have them removed a couple of days later. Um, there was no difference in a different study looking at the complications between whether you left a drain or did repeated paracentesis. Um, but in short, in someone who's got significant ascites, you're going to have to figure out a way to manage that at the time of the hernia repair. Um, this is a couple of case reports of doing an umbilical paracentesis to convert an emergency case into an elective operation. Um, so basically, uh, similar to this picture, you, under ultrasound guidance, you could aspirate the fluid from the hernia, which would then allow you to reduce the hernia and maybe optimize the patient before diving in for a surgery. In conclusion, optimizing and timing of the patients is, is just a tricky situation no matter what. These patients are probably best cared for at a transplant center um, where they have um, capabilities to manage them in the perioperative setting. Uh, rebalanced hemostasis is an important concept to um, not necessarily give them a lot of products um, and induce portal hypertension. You want to balance the risk of infection and recurrence in deciding what to do with these patients. So if a patient's got a high meld and the mortality is high anyway, you don't really have to worry about recurrence because um, their cirrhosis is going to get them before their recurrent hernia does. Uh, minimally invasive role is not well defined for, defined for these patients, and aggressive control of ascites is important. Thank you.